And last but not least, my uh, colleague, Dr. Barnes, will be talking about strategies to improve periprocedural anticoagulation management. Great. Well, thank you. And hopefully, you guys, uh, your heart rate's getting up. We've been running through this really quickly. I'm going to present this last talk here. Um, when we think about how to manage anticoagulants before and after a surgical procedure, I think there are a couple barriers that exist. The first is, how do we actually risk stratify our patients, and are we doing this uniformly uh, across the board? What are the differences between some of the new drugs that maybe our procedural colleagues are less familiar with versus some of the older drugs that they're more comfortable with? Do they understand those different properties? When we make these decisions, are we actually following the evidence in how we make the decision, or are we just sort of using our gut to guide the kind of decision making that we, uh, that we say about whether the drug should be stopped, should we need bridging, those sorts of things? And of course, how do we actually communicate all of that to our patients and to other providers? So thinking about the risk stratification element, well, we all know that we want to think about the thrombosis risk. How likely is it that somebody's going to have a clot in that period right before and after the surgical procedure? But we have to weigh that against the risk of bleeding. And I want to make sure that you remember the risk of bleeding is not just about the patient factors, but also the procedural factors. So you need to sort of consider all three of these elements when you're trying to decide what's the likelihood of bleeding and thrombosis, and therefore, how am I best going to manage my patient. This is a slide that shows a couple key properties of all the different anticoagulants, but I want to point out to you the way they can be grouped and some of the similarities. We all know about warfarin. It's the one that our surgical colleagues are most familiar with, and they're probably familiar in particular with the fact that it takes four to 10 days before warfarin is really fully therapeutic. They feel comfortable starting that drug right away the night after surgery because it's not going to have effect for a number of days. All of the new direct oral anticoagulants, they're going to be fully effective within a couple hours. They actually have properties much more similar to low molecular weight heparin. So I always tell my surgical colleagues that if you would not start a full dose low molecular weight heparin on your post-op patient, you shouldn't be starting them on one of the direct oral anticoagulants either because they're going to have full anticoagulation effect. Now, how do we make decisions? We actually went through and we asked a number of procedural docs, primary care docs, and cardiologists. We said, let's give you some scenarios of an AFib patient with a number of risk factors. Would you choose to stop, when you, when you stop their warfarin, would you choose to give them low molecular weight heparin bridging? And here's what they told us across the scenarios. The low risk patients, the chads of one with no prior stroke, nobody really uh, gave them any bridging. Chads of three without a prior stroke, about a quarter of patients, uh, about a quarter of providers chose to bridge, but the majority didn't. The same stroke risk, but now because that patient previously had a stroke in the past, suddenly we're jumping to near 80% of patients are choosing to bridge. And obviously our high risk group, those with the Chads of five and a prior stroke, they chose to bridge as well. So you see this big sort of splaying in particular around the prior history of stroke. Yet we know from the bridge trial where there were about 16% of all patients had a prior stroke, there was no benefit to using low molecular weight heparin bridging. And so there's this little bit of disconnect between what most doctors feel from their gut gosh, if you've had a stroke in the past, I need to bridge you, versus what some of the data is telling us when that it may not necessarily be effective. So what are the strategies that you can use to actually help manage your patients? Well, the first is I'd encourage you to use uh, references. So think about risk stratification and make sure you're documenting, is this a low-risk patient, a high-risk patient? What are the features? When you think about whether or not to bridge, really be key in what your decision is and why you're making that. Not just, eh, I have a gut decision, but I'm following evidence, I'm following a clinical pathway. And then think about those same references for drug management. When should you start uh, stop the drugs before the procedure? When should you stop them afterwards and make sure you're following some kind of an algorithm. It's really important as you make those decisions that you're also communicating that. And so be careful about some of the vagaries that we often talk about. If you're going to tell a patient to hold a drug for 48 hours, well, what does that mean? Do they take their last dose 49 hours before the procedure? Or do you want them to take the last dose that would have occurred before? So instead of using some of that, give them a calendar and say, on Tuesday you take the drug, on Wednesday you don't take the drug, on Thursday you don't take the drug, and on Friday you're going to have your surgery. Make it really clear clear so patients know what's happening, and then make sure you're documenting that in the chart. Otherwise, the other clinicians have no idea what's going on.
And then, of course, think about ownership. Who's actually going to make this decision? So often, we have situations like on the left where the surgeons may or may not be talking to a, an anticoagulation clinic or a, an anesthesia clinic or a primary care clinic, and the patient's totally confused. How can you think about reorganizing your system so that you're able to institute protocols, everyone knows who's going to make this decision, who's going to manage the coordination and make sure that the patient knows exactly what they do before their surgery. I will also tell you that there's an ongoing study, the PAUSE study, where they're using some standard protocols for managing the direct oral anticoagulants. When we get the results of this, I think it's going to help us standardize uh, when we should choose to stop these drugs, because right now there's some variation in different expert opinions as to how many hours before a surgery you should stop each of these drugs. And here's just an example of some pocket references that you can use. Thank you very much.